Welcome to Patients at Risk, a discussion of the dangers that patients face when physicians are replaced with non-physician practitioners. I'm your host and the co-author of the book, Patients at Risk, The Rise of the Nurse Practitioner and Physician Assistant in Healthcare, Dr. Rebecca Bernard. And I'm so pleased to be joined by a special guest co-host sitting in for Dr. Narana Lajba. This is Dr. Amy Townsend. She is a fellow board member with me of Physicians for Patient Protection. Amy, thanks for joining us. We're back for a second discussion with Jeremy Wattenbarger. He is the father of seven-year-old Betty Wattenbarger, who unfortunately lost her life from pneumonia and sepsis just 15 hours after she was evaluated in an urgent care by a pediatric nurse practitioner who failed to properly diagnose her. And now Jeremy is fighting to make sure that other children and other patients Uh, know what kind of care they're getting and that they are kept safe. Jeremy, thanks for joining us again. Um, When we left off in part one, we we kind of recapped the story of what happened and some of the challenges that Jeremy has faced in trying to get justice for Betty, but really more than that, trying to protect other children to make sure that patients have access to physician-led care. And we talked about how it was very challenging. It took multiple efforts for you to report this to the Board of Nursing. Finally, it required your state senator's involvement to get them to even investigate. And ultimately, their only criticism of the nurse practitioner was just that she failed to completely document vital signs. And that's because those are the only things that they can can really um, oversee, which are nursing tasks. But as Amy pointed out, this nurse practitioner was not practicing nursing. She was practicing medicine. She was evaluating a child. She told the parents uh, she'll be okay. Just take her home, give her some Motrin. And of course, we know that Betty passed away just some hours later. So Jeremy, tell us, after you kind of reached the limit to what the Board of Nursing was willing to do to help, what was the next step that you took? Well, in, in parallel with the, the Nursing Board investigations, I was also opening um, you know, the complaints against the, the, the supervising doctor, Dr. Michael Cowan, um, all of those uh, were denied, denied, deny, and eventually the general counsel told me, do not file another complaint. They will not receive it or accept it because um, they got so tired of me pestering them uh, over and over with, you know, because there is multiple infractions that Dr. Cowan was responsible for. They're not willing to hold him responsible for anything. Um, and in that case, that's, that's when I, I brought up the, the position about the, the proxy and uh, asked about the proxy if that was you know, the direction they wanted to go. And they said, yes, that's, that's what we believe happened. And that's, that's, he was doing the right thing. So now they're having to investigate the proxy because they have no choice now because they, they accepted Michael Cowan as, um, you know, Michael Cowan's proxy as being true. So basically just to recap, uh, the nurse practitioner was in Texas. They're required to be supervised by a physician. Nurse practitioner was technically supervised by a physician who was on vacation, I would guess, or doing something in Cambodia and had therefore designated the supervising status to a different physician who actually may not have even been licensed to practice medicine. So what you're saying is that the board of medicine or whomever is not taking any action against the doctor who was in Cambodia because technically he had uh, passed the buck to someone else. Is that, is that right? Uh, that's correct. That's correct. Yeah. They, they said that since he had done that, you know, he was doing the right thing. He was never called by the, uh, I by see. the APN. He wasn't in the room. So he holds no responsibility and he was doing the right thing is what they say. Um, and of course now he's the part owner yeah. with the nurse practitioner. It's so interesting. You told us in the last segment that the nurse practitioner is actually at the time was, or she has been the majority co-owner of the pediatric urgent care. Yes, that's correct. She, she took uh, full ownership of the, uh, the majority ownership of that clinic in uh, the summer of 2019 after Amy, Betty's death. Amy, do you hear of other cases in which nurse practitioners or PAs are owning uh, urgent cares or medical clinics? So in the state of Texas, nurse practitioners um, can own their own clinics. Um, and, and as we talked about in the, in the last segment, um, you know, there is uh, truly a conflict of interest there um, in the fact that the, the nurse practitioner who owns the clinic is essentially employing the physician, yet the physician is supposed to be overseeing the quality of the work uh, of the nurse practitioner that's actually giving them a paycheck. Um, but that is completely 
completely legal in the state of Texas. Um, there are some restrictions on um, physician assistants and that they are not um, allowed to be majority um, uh, owners in uh, medical practices. Um, however, there are ways that they have managed to find um, loopholes in some of those uh, those laws um, to, to create the structures that, um, you know, there there are um, some some uh, physician assistants as well that primarily um, are, are owners of different clinics. It just blows my mind to think that you could have a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant owning a clinic, hiring someone to supervise them, then uh, not giving proper care to a patient, having a patient pass away, and then not being held accountable in any way for their care. You open, you hang a shingle, you say, I'm in urgent care. Urgent care means you're just as close to a, almost an emergency room. You are technically taking care of the sickest people and you're supposed to be ready to care for them. And yet clearly this is false advertising because you're not getting the kind of care that you would expect to get. Do you agree with that, Jeremy? Yeah, I, I do. Um, also, just to just to add to that too, is that the supervising physician, the the law here in the state of Texas and is chapter one hundred and fifty seven that covers the the supervisory, and there is one segment within side of the the uh, the law itself which says that the the physician is responsible for all medical acts that he delegated, he or she delegated. Um, the the medical board tends to look away from that and looks at the other part of it. And says, oh, well, you know, he wasn't in the room. He didn't get a call. So there is some conflict there also. Yeah, the, the law actually says that they are responsible. A physician is responsible um, for ensuring that whatever act they are delegating, um, that the non-physician is properly trained to do that act. So as long as they have some type of documentation saying they, they in a, uh, in good conscience have determined that the nurse practitioner is able to do that task, then they are no longer responsible for the actual task after that. And I guess technically that documentation would have been the policies and procedures of the urgent care, which Jeremy has pointed out were uh, improperly followed because the, the policy said that if vital signs were unstable, they should be rechecked before a child or a person is discharged. And I think, Jeremy, you said that, that was there were three different policies that were disregarded. Yeah, there was two policies that were disregarded. Um, the vital sign policy, though, was disregarded at least three different violations on that policy. The physician also, Dr. Michael Cowan, states that um, she did not have any variance to those policies, so she was supposed to follow those policies. And the, the nurse practitioner, um, as many people would do, is they review those policies every year. So there was absolutely no reason why she does not know her policies. Wow. I mean, uh, clearly she just, you know, used her own independent medical judgment to say that Betty was fine. Uh, but that's, there's a reason why we have those policies and procedures. And there's a reason why nurse practitioners are supposed to follow protocols and things like that. So clearly that was violated. So Jeremy, you've been working really hard to make sure that this doesn't happen again. You tried many routes. And then now most recently, you're really working now with the medical examiner's office because you're trying to get some changes made to the way Betty's death has been uh, named as a natural death. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so I know that I followed up with the medical examiner and the, it's under review right now, but yeah, that's not something I have to really focus on. Um, it's something that I, it's a request I put in, but, um, and I, I can't go into a lot of details right now about it, but there is, um, you know, the special victims unit in uh, the city of Denton has now been engaged and they have collected all my materials that I have and they've started their their process now of uh, looking at everything because at some point you you no longer can say well she just made a mistake and she misdiagnosed you have to look at it from the the other perspective number one you have a an urgent care which is not a licensed medical facility so this would fall under the same kind of guidelines that a corporation or a company would follow under um, because it's not a medical facility and if there's clearly guidelines and policies that outline patient safety or to protect, you know, a customer or anyone else that comes into their business and the customer becomes injured or ends up dying, it becomes a criminal matter at that point. Um, because now you're no longer talking about, you know, oh, I made a mistake and it wasn't intentional. She knew the policies. She knew the policies were there in place for patient safety. She violated the policies, knowing that those policies were in place for patient safety and a patient died. Um, so at that point, you have 
have what, what looks, you know, at minimum criminal negligence um, or more. So that, that's got to be looked at. And um, in that process with the medical examiner, um, you know, that's going to be handled by the police department now. That's, they're, they're talking with the medical examiner about that piece. And that's kind of out of my hands at this point. They're, uh -huh. they're working that, that avenue because this has got to the point where it's no longer simply she misdiagnosed Betty. You know, she was negligent in Betty's death because she clearly knew what she was supposed to do. And she had knowledge of what was supposed to happen on that site. She didn't do it. And then to make matters worse, within 20 minutes of uh, receiving the medical examiner's request, Betty's medical records were then tampered and altered uh, multiple times over the course of the next, uh, well, past three years. You can see almost every month they go in and do views and edits and modifies and change on the records. Yeah, that's a really big no-no. Wow. I mean, right, Amy? I mean, this is the wow. like medical legal yeah. 101, never change or alter or tamper with the medical record. It just doesn't look good. It's not right. Uh, I mean, Amy, wouldn't you say that's kind of like a, a mandatory thing for physicians, for any healthcare practitioner? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you would, you never go back and change the record, um, particularly not, um, you know, once there's documentation that a complaint or something like that. Some of the things that were some of the logs that were modified, just changing some of the information, changing the actual code of the billing code to make it seem as if a more in-depth examination and assessment was done, which actually uh, you, you've noted that may be triggering an insurance audit as well. It's already, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield has already assigned an insurance fraud investigator to that because they're concerned because the, the change came after the death. Um, and after they received the medical examiner's uh, you know, request for records, that change occurred um, the, the day after my daughter died and it was made by the doctor. Um, and they, so he, if he was not supervising and he was not there, why is he making the change and how does he know? 100%. Yeah. For any of our listeners out there, if you're a physician, a medical student, resident, never change medical records. You can write an addendum. You can, uh, of course, yeah. consult your, um, your uh, malpractice carrier. I mean, unfortunately, bad outcomes and tragedies do happen. And you, the most important thing, if you're involved in something like this is you need to figure out what went wrong, how you can learn from it, take accountability, and don't just try to uh, don't try to hide things because you never get away with it. It just doesn't look good. And so that's my advice to everyone out there. And one Absolutely. thing a lot of, a lot of doctors don't realize either. Um, and I, I come from a digital forensics background. So I did some, some research on this also was that just the simple act of viewing the record in some EHR systems can actually modify the time and date stamp. And so you see a lot of times doctors after a patient has died, will go back in and they'll start doing views on the record over and over that's not what you want to be doing because it looks like you're trying to find a way out of, you know, whatever just happened. You know, it's interesting because I, I have had bad outcomes. Unfortunately, I think we all have. And the first thing that I always want to do is to say, like, did I miss something? Was there something I could have done differently? So I've always like had that, you know, compulsion to go in and just review and look and uh, not to change things, but just to, you know, beat yourself up about it and say, what could, you know, was there a sign? Could I have done something differently? But to your point, uh, you got to be really careful even about just look going back and reviewing everything because it can look, uh, it can look bad. Mm -hmm. So you're working on those issues. And then the other thing that you've been working on, which I'm just so amazed is on a legislative basis. And can you tell us about Betty's Law and how that came about? Yeah, Betty's Law, um, it didn't even make it to the floor for a public hearing. Um, it, was, it was squashed by the legislator pretty quick because there is clearly an agenda to have unsupervised APNs. And they felt that at some way that might intrude upon that, which it didn't, but they, they felt that way. And that was simply just a, a first step in, in some accountability that, you know, there had to be a, a name badge and had to be some type of identification and the credentials. And that's, I think that was the real sticking point was that they had to have the credentials because a lot of people don't want the credentials on the badge because they want to call themselves provider, which for a, uh, a consumer or a patient or anyone else, when they come in, they say provider. Well, what's your qualifications is the next question. So if they have to call themselves provider and then put their qualifications, then they have to identify themselves as a nurse and not a provider. So they didn't like that. I, I think that was one of the big sticking points from what I understood. 
Jeremy did fabulous footwork on this, you know, in getting in, in contact in particular with his representative, Jared Patterson. And he was actually able to put me in contact with some of um, Mr. Patterson's staff. And so I've talked, I talked to them multiple times and we, you know, uh, originally were trying to model that piece of legislation after uh, legislation that was recently passed in New Jersey. So, um, you know, the, the, the legislation passed in New Jersey was very thorough in that, um, you know, not only did it, it, did it require that clearly state credentials, but they also required that in any clinic that there was not a physician on site, that there had to be some type of notification to patients publicly, um, as well as um, identifying the actual supervising physician for any non-physician on site. And so it was very thorough and is a great piece of legislation. Unfortunately, when we talk to Jared Patterson's office, um, you know, I think he's a relatively new representative, um, the chair of the, the committee um, for this type of legislation uh, was Stephanie Click, who is, um, has been trying to push independent practice for nurse practitioners for years now. And so I, I think that he was um, somewhat shy about, um, you know, pushing the extent of the New Jersey law uh, in Betty's law, but it, it was definitely something that could have been, you know, a step forward in transparency transparency to make sure that patients um, would at least be able to identify what exactly is the training of the person that you're actually seeing. Um, you know, there are those requirements already in a lot of hospital facilities, but as Jeremy has already mentioned uh, previously, urgent cares are not held to the same standards as, as hospitals. And so when you're talking about, a, a, you know, a private clinic or, um, you know, an urgent care, they don't have the same requirements for those badge identifications. And so it would have been great to kind of close that loop and to make sure that that credentials will, could be easily identified in, uh, in an outpatient setting. Right, because Jeremy, you said that not only did the nurse practitioner not introduce herself as a nurse practitioner, but she wasn't wearing any kind of identification badge and there would have been no way for you to actually know that. Yeah, there, there was nobody wearing any identification badges and that, that I understand that the nursing board does have regulations against that. And I filed that complaint and the nursing board said, prove it. Well, I don't have a picture from that day. I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of her not wearing her name badge. And so you constantly run into this, this back and forth with the nursing board is that you, you file a complaint and then the nurse says, well, no, I did. And then you have to say, well, no, she didn't. And they never believe the, the person on the other end. They always believe the nurse at that point. Um, and that's kind of where you get stuck at. Um, one of the other things I would really love to cover or, or Jeremy to talk about is, you know, um, in this year in the, the Texas legislative session, um, we had a bill that um, there were some folks that were very aggressive at trying to uh, pass independent practice for nurse practitioners in Texas. It was House Bill 2029 that was written and sponsored by Stephanie Click. Um, who was, you know, chair of, of the uh, House committee that actually was going to hear this bill. And, um, you know, we had, of course, a lot of people from, um, from a physician standpoint that showed up to give testimony, but Jeremy showed up and, and, you know, he took the time to show up and give the, the testimony about Betty. And I can't tell you how impactful um, his testimony wa was. Um, it was absolutely um, amazing. Um, the, uh, his, his discussion and his points, um, you know, as he talked to legislators. And I don't know, Jeremy, have you ever, you know, testified in front of, front of legislators before because you look like a pro? No, I, I've never testified in front of legislators before. That's something I go around doing. But, um, you know, it's when it's necessary, I, I do. I I have a, a public speaking background myself. I was a I was in radio for several years, so I, I have a public speaking background, and I also am an, an evangelist and preach in churches. So it's uh, it's it's quite a bit different though standing in front of a, a group of legislators, but they all put their pants on the same way we do. So at the end of the day, they work for me, um, and they they need to be accountable to me. And I think sometimes they're they're forgetting that piece of it. The legislators are they're forgetting the piece that they work for the people, and the people don't work for them. And um, we've seen that with Stephanie Click, you know, uh, the comments made at the beginning of the hearing uh, regarding about opposition and people are opposition to her that, you know, talk about things like what happened with Betty. Um, those type of statements that there, that's, there's no place for that in a public forum, uh, especially coming out of a legislator's mouth and then subsequently 
um, you know, her, uh, her supporters also making the same type of statements that that has no place. I mean, right. that's, that's, that's uncalled for. Right. And, in, you know, anyone who's listening to this podcast who is, um, you know, a, not involved in medicine or, um, you know, not a physician or, um, you know, not even in charge of, you know, a, a, a big healthcare system, everyday people can have an impact on um, legislation that that is passed. And so I can't stress, you know, how important it is for people to show up. Um, and, you know, like I said, you did an amazing job. And I think everybody was just in awe um, for you to get up there and tell um, a story that I know was difficult for you to tell, but it had a tremendous impact um, on, on everyone there. It almost felt like Jeremy's testimony just derailed the whole momentum that they had of getting independent practice because it almost seemed like there was just just silence after that because what you said was so impactful. And we know that legislators really, when they hear from their constituents and they hear stories about what has happened, they really, that really opens their eyes. That's really important to them. And uh, some people that were there told me that you could have heard a pin drop after you were done and that they almost felt bad for the people that went after you. It was like somebody from the AARP because, and basically nobody was listening anymore after you made that impassioned speech. Uh, it, it was just clear that this was not the right direction to go. So like you said, Amy, a, a person's experience and going up and testifying can completely change the what's going to happen with a bill, even if it seemed to be making really strong uh, progress, which I think that one did seem to be. You know, one of the things, speaking of full practice authority or independent practice and bills, I just wanted to pull up. Yeah. So there was a news article about Betty's Law, and they talked to the CEO of the Texas Nurses Association, Cindy uh, Zolnerik. And what she said, they said, what do you think about this Betty's Law? Do you think that nurse practitioners need to, you know, have more, uh, need to identify themselves and that sort of thing? And she said, quote, any patient loss is a tragedy. And while we do not know the details of this particular case, the evidence demonstrates that the care provided by advanced practice registered nurses is generally as safe or safer than physicians. You will find anecdotes of misdiagnoses with unfortunate outcomes for both, both APRNs and physicians. However, if you look at the statistics, patients have no greater risk when treated by APRNs. Amy, just before I get into my diatribe, tell me what you think when you hear that. Yeah, you know, um, I mean, that is a repetitive statement that we hear over and over from nursing leadership and APRN leadership, um, you know, um, and it's almost like if they say it enough times, they think that it's going to make it reality. Uh, and, and you know, I, I know that you will probably talk about that there are no studies out there actually looking at unsupervised practice, medical practice by, um, you know, nurse practitioners. Um, you know, all of the studies that they cite have have been done under physician supervision. Um, and most of the time they're looking at uh, very simple pre-diagnosed um, you know, problems like high blood pressure or diabetes, you know, and can we control those things? Um, those type of scenarios are much, much different than um, trying to independently diagnose uh, a random person that walks in off the street. And, and Betty is a great example. Yeah, you know, exactly what you've said. There are absolutely no well-performed studies showing that unsupervised nurse practitioners or physician assistants can provide high quality, safe and effective care. They can provide safe and effective care when working very closely in physician led teams, specifically with one on one on site supervision. They can also perform well if they are following protocols very carefully that are created by physicians and they always have a physician to refer to. Every study done has always eliminated high risk patients. Most of the time, studies have eliminated children. Most of the time, studies have eliminated anyone that has anything outside of the most basic healthcare conditions. So to make this argument that nurse practitioners can provide as good or better care than physicians just across the board and unsupervised is completely a false statement. And like you said, Amy, it seems like they feel like if they just say it over and over again, that people will believe them. 
but we're here to, here to tell you, and Jeremy is here to tell you that we need more scientific evidence that nurse practitioner practice is safe uh, before they're allowed to do it independently. And in my opinion, nurse practitioners and PA should always have very close physician supervision. To me, that means on-site supervision or at least very close, you know, phone discussions or making sure that protocols are being followed as in this case, it was not, you know, Jeremy, what do you think when you hear about this kind of, uh, you know, blase statement that she made saying, you know, she's sorry for your loss, but you know, they're still just as good. Well, I I've reached out to some of the nursing groups here in the state of Texas and asked them to, you know, hold their own accountable and they won't do it. Um, and I, I, you know, and that, that's one thing I've, I've talked to legislators about too, is metrics. Uh, metrics are very important in any setting. Um, you know, urgent cares, you know, are, are one area where you see a lot of APNs. Where are the metrics that show what they're stating is true? And I don't see them. I, I never see metrics on anything. Um, and I've asked for metrics over and over and nobody can show me metrics. So until you can show me numbers and metrics, I call BS. Mm-hmm. The training is different, right? I mean, you know, there's a huge discrepancy in the amount of training, um, the both the quantity and quality of the training that physicians receive versus uh, nurse practitioners. So, you know, the burden really is on them to give proof, um, you know, of the statements that they're making, and they just have not done it. Especially as we see the increase of these diploma mills, these online schools, uh, we know that I think this nurse practitioner that saw Betty had graduated in 2007, so she wasn't a brand new graduate. But you know, nowadays we're seeing less and less well high quality training. We're seeing a lot more online training. So you're 100% right. We need to see those metrics. I find it very interesting that while half of the states in the union allow unsupervised practice and have for some years there is still no data being published showing outcomes. And there has been plenty of opportunity to do that, but it hasn't happened. And like you said, Jeremy, if the, if the data isn't there, then you know, it, the onus is really on them to show that they can be safe and effective. So one question that I have for Jeremy um, is, you know, now that, I mean, you've been through this terrible experience, I mean, how do you you now approach uh, healthcare differently. Um, you know, I would definitely think that this would have an impact on the way that you kind of, you know, approach care for, for you and your family um, from this point forward. Yeah, I mean, we, we do, we approach it uh, a lot more uh, in, a, in a cautious manner. You know, we ask a lot of questions. I, I didn't even know what a provider was until this all started. And, um, you know, now whenever I, I'm, I walk into an urgent care and or wherever I walk into, you know, there's there's still urgent care. We have Cook's Urgent Care, which is right down the street from us, uh, but they also have a uh, on-site physician inside of that urgent care too, um, and he's he's there, and the dude is legit. I mean, he's he was an Army VA doctor, so I mean, he knows his stuff, and uh, he was a primary care doctor. So if we go to a pl- any place like that, that's who she sees. My my other daughter does. Um, you know, the same thing with me. I I don't. I won't see a mid-level at all. I, it has to be a doctor. And sometimes that can be kind of cumbersome, especially in our area where we're at, because doctors are being pushed out more and more. Um, and we're seeing a, a higher level of, you know, like total men's primary cares, um, a Denera, um, urgent care, urgent care, urgent care, urgent care type c- scenarios, mid-levels everywhere, and no doctors to be found. And there was even a, a new practice that was opened up that's supposed to be uh, a doctor's primary practice, and you call down there, and they said, "Well, you can see the provider, um, and the doctor only comes in once a week." Well, that's really not sufficient. Mm-hmm. So, it, it does it does become very difficult. We live close to uh, you know a few large cities, but you see them dotted all throughout the Texas landscape. The the urgent cares have uh, really cropped up everywhere, and they're almost to the point where it, it makes it very confusing for a patient. Um, you have something that needs to be seen, but it's not quite what you think is an emergency and you're uh, not sure where to go. You end up walking into one of them and then all of a sudden they're saying, well, hey, we got a provider. Well, most people, when they hear the word provider, they hear doctor. They're thinking it's a mm-hmm. doctor and it's really not. Um, and you want to ruffle some feather, feathers, uh, simply say, well, you mean nurse, don't you? And uh, or APN. Yeah, that that really aggravates people. I've noticed that it really causes some people some angst. And I have no idea why, but own yeah, it. And, you are what and, you are. 
That's one of the, the primary things that we want to convey to the public is that it is perfectly okay for you to ask about the training of the person that's going to provide your health care. That is one of our most important messages is to have that transparency. And so we want to give patients kind of the, uh, the tools um, to be able to do that so that you can advocate for yourself and advocate for your family. Absolutely. In just our last few minutes, Jeremy, do you have any uh, other messages or anything else you want to say to our listeners today about what you've been through and about Betty? Yeah, I, I mean, the, you know, if something does happen, God forbid it does happen, then you have to be aggressive with these people. You have to go in and you have to take charge and you have to really push them. Otherwise, nothing will get done. They'll, they'll literally sit there and run the clock out on you and say, oh, well, it happens sometimes. And that was the exact statement the, the doctor made during his testimony at the end was, oh, well, these things happen sometimes. No, no, they don't. They shouldn't happen sometimes. And I think that you know patients, especially in the state of Texas, need to really be aware of you know, how our current state is. And, and I'm not talking about just the, the state itself, but I'm talking about the state of the, the actual laws and regulations that are here um, they are not patient friendly. I'll tell you that they are not patient friendly. Um, I'm running into it over and over. Um, you know, we we have medical liability caps, which are one thing that needs to be addressed. We've talked about it. It's okay that they're in place. However, the the requirement to have a expert report before discovery is absolutely ridiculous. It was one of the things that held us up um, in collecting any type of evidence for almost a year. Do you know what you can do to evidence in a year? trying to collect ev no evidence for a year. You can't do any discovery until the expert report is accepted by the, uh, the actual judge itself. So, and Jeremy, did that, did that hurt. expert report have to be from another nurse practitioner or was it able to be a physician? It, it, it could be from a physician. In this case, it was from a physician. Um, and that's, that had to be submitted though, before the case could even be brought forward to even do discovery. That right there in itself is, is a travesty of justice. Uh, it's it's very important at the very beginning if something like this happens a sentinel event a you know a never happened type of event you know those types of things you need to be collecting evidence immediately and a lot of people in the state of Texas aren't aware of you know how bad the laws are and how poorly they are written and they've continued to degrade them at one point there used to actually yes. be on-site supervision here there actually used to be on-site supervision they pulled it away and so you you constantly see this yeah. This, this, this erosion of patient safety and patient rights here in the state of Texas. Um, and it needs to be addressed. I've addressed it with multiple representatives and uh, senators, but nobody seems to really, you know, uh, want to take charge and actually run with it. And so I'm, I'm continuing to push. Um, me and the representative Biederman's office had a very good discussion about this. Um, you know, I sent him over three things. One of them was the, the chapter 74 issue. The, uh, the other one was that I believe that we need to have an ombudsman assigned at some point for these nursing board and medical board investigations who actually are having some oversight because I can't tell you who actually oversees those board investigations. Mm -hmm. And I've never been able to figure that out. They operate in a black hole that's completely anonymous to everybody. And most patients don't realize that when they file a complaint, that investigation can go several different ways. And a lot of them, it's not very good. Um, they're, they're not looked at, they're not reviewed, and you have no oversight and nobody's actually following up with you or giving you status. And Lord help you if you try to ask for the actual testimony itself, because I went through that also with the, uh, the nursing board asking for the nurse's testimony that was initial, initially given because she's given contradictory statements multiple times. And I was denied by the nursing board to have it. They said, you have to appeal to the AG. I appealed to the AG. The AG said, no, you can't have it based on occupational codes. So who actually can see those documents? And that's what we ran into too with the Tarrant County Medical Examiner. I asked for the original set of records for Betty. Um, they classified them as highly confidential and said that I did not have enough clearance to see those. And they had to be approved by the AG to be seen. Wow. wow. So these are the types of things we have going on in the state of Texas. And I don't think a lot of patients are aware of it. I think a lot of patients need to be aware of it. And I think they need to know that you know, when you walk into an urgent care or any place for that matter, if you're being seen by an APN, you might want to think that about that twice again, because they're really not being held accountable. I mean, the medical board, maybe it might happen, but the nursing board, good luck. They, they cover rear ends like nobody's business down there. They hide 
And I'm telling you, you have to literally get the general counsel on the phone to, to get anything done down there. Um, they'll tell you, and I, I know Amy ran into this too, we don't have the money to continue. Uh, we don't have enough uh, bodies or people to be able to further this investigation. This is all we can do. No, I think I pay enough in tax dollars. You can do that. I think you can handle that. I'm absolutely amazed at what you have been able to to accomplish. And, you know, um, I look forward to continuing to, you know, work with you on legislation that hopefully we can, um, you know, move the ball forward in the next session um, and we'll continue to push. Um, that's all yep. we can do. Yeah. And in the meantime, you know, patients just need, like, like Amy was saying, it's okay to ask. And one quote that I have from Jeremy here was that if they had known that the provider was a nurse practitioner and not a doctor, quote, we would have, if we had known she was an advanced practice nurse, we would have said, you know what? She probably doesn't have the skills to see Betty based on the way she looked that day. And they would have taken her to an emergency room. So you do need to ask and it's okay to seek out physician led care. There's nothing wrong with that. To learn yep. more about this topic, we would encourage you to get the book Patients at Risk, The Rise of the Nurse Practitioner and Physician Assistant in Healthcare. It's available at Barnes & Noble and at Amazon.com. Please subscribe to our podcast and our YouTube channel. It's called Patients at Risk. If you're a physician, please join our group. It's called Physicians for Patient Protection. Our website is physiciansforpatientprotection.org. If you're a patient listening and you want to tell your story or you have concerns, please reach out to us. Uh, we would love to talk with you and uh, get your story out there. Thanks so much, and we'll see you on the next podcast.